Started. If people are logging in, they can join us where we're at. But we're so grateful to have everyone here tonight. Um, welcome to our final night of the Wrestle Like a Girl and Division One Women's Wrestling Speaker Series. Over the last two days, we have been extremely fortunate to hear from some of the most unparalleled insight from some of the most influential female leaders in our sport. Uh, the last two nights, we heard our experts discuss why women should explore coaching as a career as well as how to hone and advance our coaching skills once we do secure a coaching position. Uh, but tonight's topic is just gonna be a little bit different. Although we would of course love to see more women pursuing coaching roles, we also know two major things. One, coaching is not for everybody. And two, wrestling is pretty desperate uh, for women to fill and lead in essentially every facet of the sport. So tonight's topic is gonna be all about careers in wrestling beyond coaching. Some of the things we're going to be exploring are what roles actually exist in wrestling outside of coaching. How can we learn to toss out the idea that in order to be a meaningful contributor to the sport of wrestling, you have had to have an elite competitor experience. Um, how can we use our unique backgrounds and expertise to carve out a space for ourselves in the wrestling realm? And of course, one of our major goals in life, how can we use our platforms to elevate other women alongside us? Uh, my name is Jackie Davis. I am currently on a wrestling and traditional working break while I soak up full-time mamahood to my 17-month-old son and my new baby girl coming next month. Wish me luck. Um, but prior to this, I worked in leadership and coaching positions in the streets, USA Wrestling, and D1 Women's Wrestling. I am super excited to learn alongside everybody tonight, and I'm beyond honored to present tonight's speakers, all of whom I've admired both in my athletic and professional careers for many years. Um, an important note is although this discussion specifically is speaking on the experience of women in professional positions within wrestling, we welcome all who are interested in learning with us. So if you logged in and you're like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm in the right place right now, please stay, learn with us. Um, and then just a quick rundown of tonight. After introducing tonight's panelists, uh, we already have a set, uh, a set of prepared questions that we're gonna ask them. We welcome all of our attendees to drop some questions in the Q&A section, um, but we're not going to actually answer those until toward the end of our session. Um, so yes, if you do have questions, please, please, please drop them in the Q&A se section at the bottom of your screen. Should probably look like two little chat bubbles and a Q&A above it. We're going to save the actual chat box for, um, for us to share links or resources and, and any comments that you might have throughout the session. Um, so without further ado, I would love to introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Charlotte Bailey, a physical therapist. Charlotte is an advocate and ambassador for grassroots women's wrestling, as well as women in every essential role in wrestling. She co-founded Female Elite Wrestling in 2012, has been the Iowa USA Women's Wrestling Director since 2014, has founded and directed numerous critical Iowa women's wrestling tournaments and is an essential player in the sanctioning of Iowa women's wrestling. Thank you so much, Dr. Charlotte Bailey, for joining us tonight. Our next one is our next speaker is Joan Fulk. Uh, Joan has co chaired the USA Wrestling Girls High School Development Committee, a committee supporting the growth and landscape of girls high school wrestling. And she's done so alongside Andrea Yamamoto for over seven years now, which is crazy. Um, she's currently the USA Wrestling Board of Directors second vice president, as well as the USA Wrestling Women's Age Group Council Chair. And if that isn't already impressive enough, she also sits as a member of the National Wrestling Coaches Association Board of Directors. Thank you so much, Joan, for joining us. Our next speaker is Taylor Gregorio. Taylor started her communications career at Oklahoma State, where she was the sports information director for the wrestling and tennis teams. 
Upon graduating with her master's, Taylor accepted a job with USA Wrestling, where she spent six and a half years traveling the world and covering the sport at the highest level. In spring 2022, Taylor gave birth to her first child, Theo, who I will personally vouch is one of the cutest humans I've ever seen, uh, and spent the rest of the year adjusting to life of a working mama with a heavy travel schedule. This past March, Taylor made the move to professional soccer, accepting a new job as the managing, direct, managing editor of digital and social media with the Colorado Rapids and MLS Cup championship team. Thank you so much, Taylor, for joining us. Our next speaker is Dior Gwigny. In 2001, Dior joined the inaugural Menlo College women's wrestling team, making her a member of one of the founding women's collegiate wrestling programs in the country. Pretty freaking cool. Currently, she is the CEO of Eat the Streets New England, and as such, Dior is the key management leader responsible for overseeing the administration, programs, operations, and strategic planning of the entire organization. Using her experience as an immigrant from the Dominican Republic, Dior has put trauma-informed coaching and training at the forefront of her work with Beat the Streets and has developed a passion for sports-based youth development through wrestling. Dior completed her certificate in nonprofit management and, a leadership, uh, and leadership through the Institute for Nonprofit Practice at Tufts University. Currently, she's in the process of continuing to develop her executive leadership skills through the Harvard Kennedy Executive Nonprofit Leadership Program. And if she wasn't already busy enough, <laughs> Bjork continued to contribute to the wrestling community through her roles as head coach for the Harvard Women's Wrestling Club, let's go Bjork, uh, board officer, officer and secretary, as well as a chairperson for the Ethics, Diversity, and Advocacy Committee for Beat the Streets National, as a U.S. GRIT facilitator responsible for growing Greco wrestling in the New, New England region, as a committee member for USAW Safe Score, and finally, as the president for the Massachusetts Wrestling Association, as well as a women's and Greco national team coach for the state of Massachusetts. I'm out of breath reading the yours accolades, so she must like be fully exhausted doing them. <laughs> so thank you so much, Bior, for joining us. Uh, our next speaker is Susanna Silstead. Susanna has been an official for 11 years, officiating Olympic style, folk, Olympic style, folk style, and beach style wrestling. During that time, Susanna was the head coach for a girls varsity wrestling program for four years. She's been a part of eight international trips, three of them being the Pan American Games and Championship. Her main trip was to Serbia in 2022 for the Senior World Championship, where she achieved the highest level you can get internationally for officiating, which is the Category 1S. Let's go. Susanna has officiated at the highest competing events in the United States, Final X four times, Senior Challenge Tournament two times, the Olympic and the World Championship. Susanna won the Zach Era Award for Up and Coming Official in 2019. Her hard work has given her the opportunity to be a part of two committees as well. She's the NCWWC liaison for women's college wrestling, and she is also part of recruitment and retention of developing states. Outside of wrestling, she enjoys Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, she holds a blue belt, camping, and being around friends and family. So not only is she a bad mama jamma on the mat, but I am certainly not going to mess with her blue belt. <laughs> uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, is Leslie Tamayo. Uh, Leslie is currently an M1 level mat official under USA Wrestling, a category one referee with UWW, as well as an NCAA referee. She was the first woman to referee the Arizona State Championships, the same tournament that she competed and won when she was younger. She has worked seven US Opens, Junior Worlds 2022, and was selected to work men's junior college nationals. She feels indebted to the sport, which has provided her with wonderful opportunities. And so she was always looking for ways to get back. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for joining us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. My goodness, are we like lucky or what? The crazy powerhouse group of women that are here tonight. <laughs> um, so everybody, um, I would like to get started on hearing the knowledge that these women are about to drop on us. Um, the first question is directed towards everybody. Uh, we just heard you guys' bios, but we would really love to hear, to hear um, your journey to the roles that you currently have in wrestling um, or your most recent roles in wrestling. And something I, I think um, to think about maybe while you're answering this is, did your journey to your current role start with the idea of coaching and organically evolve, or did you always know from the beginning that you wanted to contribute in ways beyond coaching. 
Um, so I'm going to open it to the floor. I'd love to hear from each of you on this. Okay, I'll go first. So you guys don't have much to follow. No, kidding. Um, so for me, my most recent role was with USA Wrestling. I was there six and a half years. And so I was covering the sport through um, social media and website for um, the mad.com. And so, yeah, that's the answer to that question. And I, um, I, I didn't actually ever see wrestling until I was in college. So for me, like coaching was not really on my radar at any point. So I kind of fell in love with the sport through my time at Oklahoma state and wanted just to find a way to be involved with the sport as long as I could. And I didn't really realize that that could like turn into a career. And so I was really um, excited when I was able to accept that job with USA wrestling and, and learned quite a bit and um, felt right. when I went into the job, I didn't feel that confident in my skill set in the sport or my knowledge of the sport. And I left feeling very confident and I still um, write for UWW from time to time. So just kind of knowing that, yeah, my knowledge is good enough to write for our international federation is a pretty cool thing to, you know, and look back at where I came from. So yeah, there's my answer. Thank you, Taylor. I think it's like what I heard from there is like, I didn't see it. So I didn't know it was possible kind of a deal. Um, so I love that you are filling that position and making sure that other women out there know that this is possible. My roles currently in wrestling are as the co-founder of Female Elite Wrestling, the Iowa USA Wrestling Women's Director and the Northern Plains Regional Rep. And so each of those sort of came to be um, differently, um, but I was actually appointed as the Iowa USA um, Women's Director just from being an involved parent with a female athlete at the time that the Women's Director stepped away. So I did not intend to be there. That wasn't the role necessarily that I was, was looking for, um, but with my background in, uh, in leadership, I actually, I think because I'm a physical therapist, because I specialize in integrative health and because I specialize in chronic pain and so much of it is just movement and the nervous system and all of that, that it was okay for me to take my experience as a coach in gymnastics and then be able to come into um, to that role but certainly like stepping in as a director without doing all of the things that, um, that the coaches in the organization did in order to get to their spots um, was a different path and um, something that I think um, not everyone would feel um, comfortable doing. So I'm really excited that we're doing this right now um, so that people can see that uh, maybe they didn't have the same um, piece you know in terms of like they didn't picture themselves here I think we heard that the other nights as well right like they didn't picture themselves being mentored by the person that the people that ended up being mentored and they didn't necessarily picture themselves trying to be coaches so when they were in their athlete roles right they weren't in their athlete roles trying to be coaches like we we sometimes find ourselves where our community needs us and I think that's um, a fun and exciting way to be involved Um, so there's going to be a discussion on like carving your space out in the sport and like your unique kind of talent. So I love that you touched on that. It's a nice little nugget to drop in and we'll pick that back up later, but thank you so much, Charlotte. I'll jump in next on that gymnastics background. You know, I walked through the door into wrestling through gymnastics. I was the women's gymnastics coach at Central Michigan University. And at that time, the governing body was the AAU and they held their world team camps there. And I met my future husband there and, and actually went in and said, hey, I need all my crash mats back. I'm running a camp and I don't think you guys know how to stretch very well. So I kind of walked into it in a, in a, unique, uh, a unique way. Uh, currently, you know, I'm so honored to hold the positions in USA Wrestling that I do. And, and I'd like to say everybody on the call, you never know what's in your future. You know, you just keep opening the doors and reaching out to the next person, the next person, and, and those doors will open. Uh, the longest uh, 
position that I've held uh, is alongside Andrew Yamamoto as co-chairs of the Girls High School Development Committee. Uh, I have to laugh a little bit. Andrea said, you know, we're doing this for like three years, right? And then five years gets there. And she goes, Joan, we only said five years and we're starting number eight. Uh, but around 2015, 2015, Kira Berry said, hey, colleges, and there were like 24 colleges in 2015. So think of the growth there. But she said, we've got to get the high schools to develop more programs and have those state championships. So Andrea and I just raised our hand and said, hey, we'd love to work on that. So that really uh, created the journey we've been on. Uh, in 2018, just to let you know kind of how that process works, uh, I was actually asked to put my name in as uh, to be nominated as an at-large board member for USA Wrestling. At that time, to my knowledge, at this point, uh, we had never had a female voted in in an at-large position. There are six of those on the board. Uh, so I, I was nominated and on the board for those two years and then uh, again nominated uh, to be second vice president in 2020. And again, honored to be the first woman elected uh, to an officer position uh, in the organization. And along with the education and support that we need at the high school level, another one of my passions really is, is to create that stronger system uh, and put it in place for support for our women's directors within USA Wrestling. So again, along with the encouragement and there's those mentors that kind of keep pushing us along on the journey. Mark Ryland uh, put, said, you know, Joan, put your name in. Uh, I want you to put your name in for the Women's Age Group Council Chair. So after some discussions and lots of texts and phone calls, uh, I did that and, and I'm very uh, honored again to serve in that position. So. That's kind of my journey through the gymnastics door, uh, married into wrestling, and it just became, you know, part of our, our lives. So there you go. Thank you. I'll kind of lead off of that with her. Um, I pretty much started um, with only one year and a half, like a year and a half of wrestling in my background. I didn't know much. I started my senior year. Um, but I fell in love with the sport prior, it just took a little bit to convince the family to let me do it and got it my senior year and just fell in love and kept going. And then, um, then right now I hold the committee spot for the NCWWC liaison. Um, I help out with all of that. I'm right now our highest ranked woman official. Um, I think the last time there was that was back in 2000s. So it was a hard battle to work the way up to that. So that was fun. Um, I just didn't really plan on officiating, got injured, was going to go to college. And I, going off of the mentoring, I had people from my state saying, hey, you should try this. You are very picky on what you do and want to make sure you do it correctly. So how about you try refereeing? It was a hard start. Um, I'll admit that. But I kept pushing through and didn't want to stop because I was like, I'm loving this. I'm loving the traveling in Washington state. And I love the traveling through the U S and it, I just didn't want to stop. So I just kept going. So, yeah, that's pretty much all I got right now. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jenna. I, I was just leaving us just a moment in case someone was like, ah, I want to jump in, but um, at the, from Charlotte, Joan, and Susanna, I have all heard, there's like Joan like volunteering later on in your career, but it sounds like there's a lot of people around all three of you who were like, I see something in you and you should be involved. Um, so I love that kind of nugget that you had some really strong and excited people supporting you and encouraging you. I'll come in from the other angle then, or, um, so I, you know, I have more of the traditional started wrestling in high school on an all boys team. And during that time, there was a lot of changes happening in the world of women's wrestling. So, you know, late nine, I'm aging myself here, but late nineties is when we started having the national competitions for women. Um, that's when the university started having women's programs. So I was part of one of the first three women's programs in the nation. And so a lot of it was just uh, not knowing that these opportunities were available until they were, and then taking that leap of, of faith to jump in. Like I went to college sight unseen and just hope for the best. Right. And, um, then I 
learn that there was going to be Olympic opportunities, which there weren't before. And that was another thing. You're just trying to jump in and figure it out as we went along. And unfortunately, that wasn't my journey. And, and I left the sport for a really long time and started my professional career. And, and I left the sport in a way where I was like, I'm never going back. Like, I never want anything to do with wrestling. That's it. I'm done. I'm moving on. Found other sports. I was on the national rugby team. And then it wasn't until I, I moved to Boston and was asked time and time again to volunteer for tournaments and kept saying no, that I finally went and saw a youth tournament for the first time. I'd only ever wrestled competitively. So to see uh, kids stepping on the mat and the smiles on their faces, I was like, all right, like, how do I get involved? How do I, how do I join this and, and help in some way? And at the time I was deep into my event planning career. So I brought that to the table and started volunteering for Boston youth wrestling and, um, and that led to just other opportunities. It felt very much like 20 years before where you're just jumping in and you're not knowing what's going to happen or where it's going to go, but you know, you want to be there and, and you can't quite put your finger on it, just like the sport. And um, the one thing that I did bring with me was not only was I a female in the sport, but also an immigrant, a kid of color and being able to volunteer. Um, I kept bringing that to the table with me too. So they're like, Hey, do you want to coach our girls team? I'm like, sure. Do you have a boys team? Do they need a coach? And they're like, yeah, sure. And I was like, great. I'll coach both. Um, and then coaching led to part-time work, part-time work led to becoming a director and, you know, really being able to bring in the passion of the youth development and helping work through trauma. And then that led to an executive director position. And that really is what pushed me to become a CEO. I didn't think that I ever wanted to be a CEO, but through wrestling, I kind of like refound my power there and, and wanted that and wanted to continue to give. So currently I serve as the CEO of Beat the Streets New England. I'm the only female CEO for all of Beat the Streets nationwide. And so I hope to continue to, to move forward and like create opportunities for the next generation of female CEOs coming up and leading and creating opportunities for all of our kids that are coming through our wrestling um, program. So it's, it's that thing where I think the baton keeps going around, right? Like you pass it, but it comes back. And then you keep passing that baton again and again until we bring everyone forward with us. So after this, I hope to become a board member and pass this baton to someone else and, and keep moving forward. Thank you so much. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? I love that story. I love your intros, every single one of them. Uh, I'll step in. Uh, so I'm Leslie. I've been wrestling since I was 12 years old and I've been a referee since I was 15 years old. I uh, just this, uh, when I realized I wasn't going to be wrestling in college anymore, I, you know, I stepped in and being an official a little bit more seriously. I, I first officiated as a way to help my parents pay for Fargo because I trained all year for Fargo with the intent of being a national champion. And uh, once I felt short of that dream and I fell short of, you know, wrestling in college, there's not a whole lot of opportunities in the West Coast. So once I realized I needed kind of transition somewhere elsewhere, I kind of stuck with officiating. And I've been encouraged to try all three styles. <laughs> I've been encouraged to try all three styles. And uh, I really have a heart for freestyle and folk style. I, you know, so I right now I'm in the transition, I packed up my life from Arizona to Iowa sorry, to Iowa and um, just want to really focus and get the ball rolling in collegiate wrestling, collegiate officiating. I really found a passion and a love for collegiate officiating. And I know there's not a whole lot of women in that. And I really want to get that ball rolling there. Um, I am a pretty big fan of actually Emma Randall was talking about this last night, Leslie, that, uh, you recognize that your area was something that was maybe limiting some of your goals uh, professionally. And so like being in Iowa really opened up a lot of doors for you to continue progressing. So I think that's a really cool um, just nugget. Oh, it is. Thank you. Yeah, I, once I saw that the Hawkeyes opened up a program, I'm like, this is my sign. I need to go just make everything happen. Don't make it all talk. You need to go now. I haven't regretted my decision. It's been the best decision I ever done. Proud of you because it's cold, cold as heck there too. So from Arizona to Iowa, a lot of coats you gotta get. 
<laughs> That's fine. As long as I got wrestling, it's okay. We're indoors anyway. <laughs> True. Um, okay. I, so this next question is open to the whole floor. N not everybody has to answer, but it's a pretty meaty question. And I felt like every single person in this group had uh, a really unique perspective uh, that they could offer. So if you feel like you can't contribute or you don't want to contribute, no pressure, but definitely open to everybody. Um, I think that it's pretty natural for all of us to look um, at wrestling and see the underrepresentation of women in coaching roles. Um, but as we have heard, coaching is not necessarily for everybody or it's not necessarily everybody's goal. Um, so I would first like to hear what roles exist in wrestling that you guys see outside of coaching um, uh, that are also underrepresented by women. And then maybe even the deeper thought is, are there roles that the professional side of wrestling desperately needs but currently doesn't have that you would like to see women create or fill in the future? And I'll open it to the floor. I'll go first, um, going based on why I moved here. I saw that there's not many collegiate folk style officials that are women at all. If you look at the women's at the NFL, D1 division football, um, in the soccer world cup, they had all female staff for like the, you know, the men's matches. And that was amazing. That was beautiful. But I, there's like me and one other lady in Kansas, but she's off for the season due to injury. So it's just been me trying to work and like work as hard as I can. Like I've been officiating college for two years and I went from having almost no opportunities and just assisting to um, being able to, you know, do my first division one open in just two years. And I qualify for men's junior college national championships. I unfortunately had to turn it down because I was head official of girls folk style nationals. And I already committed to that. And it's rude to like, be like, Oh, I can't say no to this and go to that. But you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I, it's opened up so many opportunities and I have a lot of mentors that recognize we do need women in collegiate officiating and not just like in other leadership roles in there too. And uh, I'm just ready to see where this is going to go. But I know that there needs to be women to fulfill these roles in the NCAA. I feel similarly about wrestling media. When I first started um, my journey, I looked around and I didn't see a whole lot of women. Um, if I'm remembering right, I didn't see any women. Um, so that was like, I wouldn't say it was tough because I guess I didn't recognize that like that part of it. Um, but I think as I got more and more into it, I started, I guess I got really self-conscious when I did recognize that there weren't a lot of women and I'll say like there's SIDs, there's a lot of female SIDs, but I guess I'm thinking more wrestling specific, um, or like USA wrestling national stuff. Um, and I got really insecure because right. I didn't have a background in the sport. And I was like, well, maybe people can tell that I don't know, like, or that I'm learning or that I didn't wrestle. And so, um, that was kind of like, and I think for some other women, that was kind of maybe a barrier for them, maybe a reason why they didn't get into it. Um, but now when I look around, there's so many more women in the sport. I would love to see more. Um, but yeah, it's it's actually really cool. There's um, a few girls or women I can think off the top of my head that are um, within that space. And um, Lori Ayers and I were part of a uh, like a lunch or a dinner. I don't remember at NCAAs where we just had a bunch of women media, wrestling media there. And it was just really cool to look around and just see like, we've got a whole table full of women that are just at this one event, you know? And so that was really awesome. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I was going to say more, but I think we're going to touch on it later. So I'll just stop right there. I just have one thing to add. And I, I think that um, hopefully it, it comes off right, but I feel like where women are underrepresented right now is in absolutely every position that doesn't have women in the title or diversity and inclusion in the title. That's where we're underrepresented, like everywhere. <laughs> and so, yes, I was going to say the exact same thing, Charlotte, where <laughs> I, you know, you just get to, to a point where you're tired of being the only one in the room. And 
I felt bad, but I would actually refuse to take on titles that said women at the end of it, because I was like, I know there's so many qualified women we need to bring into this space, but I know I can bring different things to the table. So let me go after that director role. Let me go after that state chair role. And those are the ones where we're definitely really underrepresented and pairing directors, anything with a director. Um, but obviously we still need a lot more women in this space across the board, but you're absolutely right. And I just keep pushing for those opportunities every chance that I get. That's why I think I take on too many roles or like, no, let me open that door. And then they're always going to see a woman in that space moving forward. Um, if I can, if I can make that happen. I'll jump yeah, in. Can, I'll go ahead. You go first. Oh, no, go. go. I was just going to say, I kept going off of what she said. Yeah, I agree. Like, I don't like putting the whole woman in front of title in front of everything. I just, I, when I go out there and they're like, oh, did you see that woman official? And I'm like, you guys, I'm just like any other mad official on the mat. Like, I just like to be out there and have fun and give back to a sport. And the pushing of the titles, I love being able to say, you know what? I'm going to help our committee on this side. I'm going to help this committee over here, even if it's not, it, I'm not on the full committee, but they need representation somewhere. So maybe even helping them out with certain ones. That's how I got onto the retention and recruiting side. I was helping them, giving them ideas. And they are like, you know what, your ideas are, are going pretty well. Let's put you in this slot with us on the committee. So let's have you push, let's do this. And so I agree on the title thing. I do take it and say, when people say, oh, you're, if you're a woman official and I'm like, eh, okay, well, I'll accept it. But I, I just love being part of our sport. I love hearing that aspect of it, you know, because we do look at, you know, for, for my, my side, when I'm working with all the women's directors across the nation, and there are several different, if you looked at all the positions that are within our USA Wrestling State organizations, there are so many positions and so many positions that could be filled by women, whether it's the junior chair or the uh, folk style uh, coach. It, there's just, there's numerous, numerous positions. I do want to say that since 2018, uh, at that time when I went on the board, I'm just kind of guessing I would, I like to be accurate with my data, but there may have been only four women, two athlete reps for freestyle, uh, a AAC chair, which was a female and myself. And since then, when we had to update our bylaws in 2020, the USOPC now has every committee for any NGB national governing body has to be 33 and a third percent women. And for us now, there are 13 women on the board. Uh, that's almost 30 percent because the board did grow as we added those athlete representatives. Eight of those women are athlete reps. And the, the other five are divided between three at large. And, and this was what excited me because at one point I said, well, six at large position, I was the only female. And I said, shouldn't that look maybe divided? Couldn't that? But yet there's a process and I respect and understand the process. But as, the, uh, as of the 2022 uh, election, three of those at large are women. So that's really cool that that's 50%. Uh, and then we have uh, the Women's Sport Committee Chair, which was for many, many years uh, a man. Uh, and then our independent board member, which again was uh, advised. Uh, they like for the USOPC wants to have all the governing bodies to have a independent board member. And that's also a female. So I'm really pleased to say that we are growing in some of those positions. And, and uh, that recognition is given more and more. And then I'm just going to add one more thing because you asked about what positions maybe don't exist right now. Mentoring director, right? Um, education director isn't necessarily a position within our states or our chapters, right? So there are pieces where um, there are things that we're just maybe as an organization, every state obviously being different, but in different organizations, maybe we just don't have those those roles that make a lot of sense in a lot of other organizations, but just didn't find their way into the structure of wrestling organizations yet. Super, taking notes, Charlotte, thank you, always. You know, can I jump in really quick, Jackie? I don't know our time, I'm not watching the time very good, but when I looked at that question, you know, and of course the big three is coaching, officiating and leadership. And I, I'm really pleased at how you wanted us to focus on the leadership. 
I kind of, my brain started turning it around a little bit and, and I wanted to know, and this is for everybody on the call, you know, everybody that's out there uh, listening, what are the roles that each of us need to take on to encourage all those young females that will be, ha, are in the sport or will be in the sport to help recognize themselves as leaders. And I start looking at, you know, starting with that ownership and helping them be leaders in practice, leaders in warm up, in practice, beginning of practice, teaching skills. You know, I think that's so important because kids love to give back and that develops that value in themselves as a leader. I really want to see us get our young people, especially at the high school level, in front of other organizations, tell their story, guest speakers at Rotary, at women's local businesses. To me, one of the big untapped resources for helping our young people become leaders is to get in front of women's businesses because they wanna hear the stories of these young ladies, their journey into the sport, and the value they're gaining from that. Uh, AAUW, which is American uh, Association of University Women, local PTOs, get in front of your school board, organizing those community projects. So for me, there's so many ways that we can start to support our, our athletes at a very young age through that high school and into college where they can learn to become those leaders. Um, yes. <laughs> Full stop. Thank you, Joan. Drop the mic. <laughs> um, no, I think that I, I'm not sure if this is oversimplifying at what everybody just said, uh, but it sounds like if you look at wrestling everywhere you look, there is a spot that women should be filling. And if you uh, don't see it, it I uh, who just said it? I think it was Charlotte or maybe it was just Joan. Um, look at other sports and steal from their positions um, and, and start including it. And if, if even in there, it's not there, then just create it. It, it sounds like we have the opportunity to make it whatever we want, um, which I, I love because I feel like I might be transitioning, personal note, might be transitioning from like a coaching role to something different in wrestling. And sometimes my brain was always like coaching, coaching. So now it's, it's nice to be able to know that no matter where I look, nothing's wrong. <laughs> I can contribute anywhere. Um, thank you all for sharing. Uh, this next question is for Joan, Charlotte, and Taylor. Um, none of you came from an on the mat or competitor experience um, or background. How did you specifically carve out a space for yourself in the sport that highlighted your specific skills? Um, and then maybe some things to think about while answering. Was it intimidating to do that? Um, and who were some of the important decision makers that you really leaned on or connected with along the way? I'll jump in real fast on this. So, you know, my journey into wrestling was through my late husband, Lee Allen. He never said no. <laughs> Forgive my emotion there. Uh, he was such a strong supporter of women from the get-go. He ran and organized the uh, 1990 World Team Trials. And that's a long time ago, you guys. You know, that's, you know, is that over 30 years? I kind of wrote that down at some point. But it was his vision that women should always be a part of the sport. He just, it, there was nothing. There was never a time, and I sometimes think back on it, that that he would say, well, I don't think that's possible. It was just open the door, see the next level, you know, let these take these ladies to the next event. Um, so for me, that journey was through him. And, and because I met him through saying, hey, I don't think you guys know what you're doing in stretching. Probably around 1977, 78 at one of the world team camps, he literally walked up to the Greco national team and said, she's doing your your stretching and she's doing your gymnastics and kind of walked away. I mean, I was probably 26, 27. I mean, he just, that was his way of saying, you know, this woman is qualified, here's what she's doing and, and listen up guys. So for me, uh, you know, while I walked in from the gymnastics side, uh, Lee was always there encouraging, allowing me to, to be a, a partner in the journey that he loved so much as, as his life was all about wrestling. And mine just pairs really nicely with Jones because again, coming from, you know, being a gymnastics competitor, a gymnastics coach, 
a human movement professional, right? Then, you know, stepping in and, and being the person who, who looked at warm ups and looked at dynamic mobility and, um, and just really was able to, 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 to use the skills that I had physically uh, first and then be appointed into the leadership role. I know earlier Joan mentioned Mark Ryland um, encouraging her to be in roles. Mark Ryland is actually, he coached my kids when they were in high school and then he's who appointed me as the Iowa USA Wrestling Women's Director. And the amount of respect that people had for him um, gave me um, a place and a space that it's not that he didn't question me, like when I was asking for something in particular, if I was asking for something different from what the boys had, different from what the boys need. Um, sometimes we had to, to kind of work through those things, um, but he, he definitely um, was a part of laying the groundwork for me to be able to have those conversations. And even if I was getting outvoted on things, <laughs> You know, at some point, you know, my even before I was on the board, my husband and I recognized that female elite wrestling needed to exist because girls and women needed things that I didn't have the autonomy to do in any of my other roles. And so just like Wrestle Like a Girl and D1 Women's Wrestling, right, like these things didn't exist before and someone had to um, had to decide it was important and then and then start doing that work. And so. Um, really, as far as important decision maker, right, within the state, um, the state chairperson is, is really the, the center and source of, of the, the power and connection to the organization with USA Wrestling. And having um, someone like that in your corner goes a long way. But I think as we continue to support each other and continue to speak about each other's skills and talents, um, you know, like you said, Joan, when, when someone says, hey, this is the person with the technical skills to do what needs to be done right here, um, go ahead and get out of her way and, and, and let her do this much needed work. Um, I, I, there, I don't know that there's much more powerful than that, but it's exciting to be at a point where we women are doing it for each other. I'm really proud to say that I have a pretty similar story to Charlotte in that, where I had... Um, just a really important figure that was in my corner while I was at Oklahoma State. Um, I got to work with John Smith, name drop. Um, and it was really cool. Um, when I started though, um, I mean, just in sports in general, I was like, I'm a very emotional person. I've always been, I still am. Um, I was, I was always scared all the time. And, um, John really kind of taught me to, um, his words, get tough. And so I learned how to navigate those spaces um, with a little more clarity of mind instead of taking things so like so personally or getting emotional about everything. And but John also um, obviously is an important figure within the sport. And so um, he had Rich Bender's year and, and Gary Abbott's year when it came time for me to try to find a job. And, you know, he built me up so much. And I, I worked with the wrestling team exclusively for um, for four years. And so he really um, kind of helped me kind of gain that confidence and he was patient with me and he um, he realized that there was a learning curve for me and he was really gracious in that and again just taught me to be confident, not just in the sport but when it comes to like approaching people like it's so he's so intimidating, but he's not like you know just the name and you know everything he's done and I remember specifically um, my last year with the team we were on a road trip or we were like driving, I think from like Clarion to Penn State, if I have the timeline right, it's only a few hour drive, but I got really, really car sick. And I was in the back of the bus, sorry, in the bathroom being car sick. And um, sorry, if this is too much. I'm going to keep going. And then I broke the handle on the toilet. And I was like, like, we're nowhere near. I'm still very sick. So I went up to the front of the bus and I go, John, we need to pull over now. And he was like, kind of looked at me, he was like, okay, okay. And then I want to say maybe a couple of weeks later, he was like, you know, you used to be scared of me. The other day you made me pull that bus over. And so like, just kind of funny. And it was just like, he really taught me how to be more confident myself within the sport. Um, but it, yeah, I also had him in my corner to help me kind of get where I needed to go next. And so I'm really grateful for John and um, just really proud to have that story. I think it's 
beautiful, but each one of you had very specific and incredible skills. But the beautiful part is that uh, it probably was shining and, and really wonderful people gravitated towards you and were like, we need this person in the sport and we want to elevate them through it. Um, and it sounds like each one of you were very lucky with that. I, I would like to hear if you guys have additional thoughts on if someone feels like they have like really powerful skills that they can contribute to the sport, but maybe haven't quite met the right advocate or ally who just who has like boosted them up. Do you have any advice for maybe how they can get the courage to get involved or step in? I think something that my dad always taught me was if you don't ask, you're never going to know. And that was just something I've carried throughout my whole life. Um, just be the squeaky wheel that needs the grease. And so I would say just find where, you know, someone that you think can help you and just be the squeaky wheel and um, keep asking. I don't know whether this fits in exactly, Jackie, with the direction, but for me, and, and I think about this like the, like, two wrestlers on the mat, you know, what a challenge that is and, and overcoming each other's, you know, best skills, et cetera. But for me, when you find that challenging person and, and I, this was what I worked with both my daughters in school, uh, you know, you go into a class and all of a sudden this teacher is like, oh man, I don't like this teacher. This is not working for me. I'm really afraid of what's going to happen here. And for me, the, the, what I, what I tried to instill in both of them was to, this is life, this is real life. And how can you step in and take this as a challenge? That's where I see it again, like, like two athletes on the mat, you know, there's that challenge. Oh my goodness, I'm wrestling the number one person. And, you know, I've just started last year. So how do you take that challenge in regular life, you know, in, in working within a coaching situation or wanting to be, you know, a member of a board or why don't you just be part of that state organization and you get that resistance? So how can you look at that as this is a challenge? I'm going to figure out how to work with this person. And I use a couple of things that I just recently learned. I'm going to start by saying, hey, I agree. We just need to have this conversation. Maybe that's as far as we can go. We're not going to agree on anything else. And, and number two is, hey, thanks for talking to me. I now understand where you're coming from. I'm learned from you that this is really important to you and and then you can just say hey let's move forward and and maybe the next conversation will be better but for me it's always the challenge instead of just saying hey I quit this is not going to work is to figure out how I will be successful just like you are on the mat just like the athletes are how will I be successful in this uh, more challenging situation and in that space where maybe there isn't space or right, there isn't somebody to build you up. Um, some of you have heard me say before that my love language is acts of service. And so the best way to get to know me is to be beside me rolling out mats or doing or picking up mats or doing whatever else needs to be done. And sometimes if you've just been in that space helping out in small ways over and over and over again, you're going to find the person there that can see and understand you and, and then help nudge you. And um, hopefully some of the people that I sent personal invites to participate in this, right, know that I'm doing that right now, that I don't know yet what their space is or what they, what they love, but that um, I'm wanting to get to know them and I'm wanting to get to know you guys. Dang, this pregnant lady over here is about to cry. This, <laughs> that's lovely. Um, yeah, so I'm here in, uh, be present, uh, be empathetic and understanding and patient and be squeaky, be the squeaky wheel. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, our next question is for Bior, Susanna and Leslie. Wrestling can be hard on women who don't have an elite wrestling background or even a background in wrestling altogether. Um, yet we know that diversity in background is critical to the progress and development of our sport. How has your background uniquely supported your role in wrestling? Um, and then I'll have a follow-up push, I'm sure, at, after you guys drop some knowledge on us. 
So um, I have a wrestling background. Um, I, I can't I can't speak for myself for others, but there's been a lot of women throughout the years who really excelled and did not have a wrestling background. For example, Sally Stanford, she refereed both college and world championships. Sheila Wagner, the first woman to ever referee the Olympics. She learned like her husband was a coach and an official or Marsha Hayes. She is the only official to be selected for the Asian Games. She did not wrestle. Her husband was a wrestling coach. So this is like a role where you don't necessarily need to have a wrestling background. There's been plenty of officials who like got into this profession and, you know, they just studied the rule book. And I, I actually encourage people who want to get into officiating to go into wrestling rooms. That way you could familiarize yourself with like how wrestling how wrestling is and how you execute the holds, what an illegal hold may look like, you know, and just to be present. And like, um, what I've also enjoyed doing is like going to wrestling rooms and addressing like people's questions and really going out there to be your own advocate for your own education. So like, I, like for me, I have the wrestling background. I've been around wrestling. I'm a mat rat, but like, there's been many great women throughout this profession who, um, don't have a wrestling background. Like, you know, they're like the mom in the stands and they're who like, you know, thought, who knew they could do better than the current officials working. So, you know, that's how Marsha Hayes got started. She's the mom was watching them, you know, her son wrestled, wasn't fond of the referees, was like, hey, where, how did I sign up? She put on a blue shirt and, you know, got to work. And she was one of my mentors before she retired. And I feel very blessed and fortunate to have learned from her. And, you know, I really like did my lot of my history. I'm a big wrestling historian. I really like um knowing how we grow as like referees and things of that nature. So to be an official, I, you don't need a wrestling background. You can still give back. Um, I'll go as well. I, you know, I also was fortunate enough to have a background in wrestling at the high school and collegiate level. But the one thing that was different for me is a lot of it you kind of feel like you're navigating on your own when you're like the only girl on a team and you're like in that hallway getting dressed or in that bathroom by yourself. And you're just like not understanding the sport to the level that your male colleagues are. Cause they're getting to build that relationship and have those separate conversations. And then going to college, um, you know, being on one of the first women's team, we all came from different backgrounds like that. So we actually didn't even know how to be teammates or how to support each other or how to lift each other up because you know, immediately it's like, well, I was the best girl at this state and I was the best girl at this state. And instead of, you know, I would say coming together as a team, we were always in some way competitors. And I left the sport with that feeling. And it, then I went and um, continued to pursue other things, right? My professional career in, in events and in corporate worlds, I went and joined and became part of a, the national rugby team. And but nothing ever like had felt the same. So it wasn't until I moved to Boston where I was like, why was I so willing to like take on these risks or move across the country or do all these things? And, and I brought it right back to that high school room where like wrestling taught me a lot of things that I hadn't realized were in me, like part of me and made me who I am. And so big thing that like I brought to, with me to beat the streets was how do we take these on the mat skills that we're learning and turn them into life skills so that we can understand them in real time and use them in real time. And so that way, um, you know, you're not looking back 20 years later and be like, oh yeah, I did learn that from wrestling or that is a skill that uh, not only helped me develop to who I am today, but it is continue to help me give back. And, um, and I'm not sure if I'm answering this correctly, but it just, it's that not even realizing that wrestling was like a lifestyle at that point, you're just suffering through the process and like learning all these things. So we didn't even have, like, I come from the generation where it wasn't until my senior year that we could like Google stuff. So how to cut weight <laughs> was like, whoever was telling you their method, how to like, um, prepare for matches. What is cauliflower ear? Like who's number one, wherever you go. Like, we didn't know any of that stuff really, unless you're reading the newspaper, but it was often a very um, like isolating space, but it, it really built me 
up to become that person that I am today and, and to dive into any opportunity and take it on and, and take the good with the bad and continue to try to like, I never want another girl to step into a space or a room where they didn't feel welcome or to get a group of women together where they don't feel like they can work with each other or collaborate with each other and move forward together. And that was the biggest lesson that I took from me uh, from back in like the early 2000s and give back through Beat the Streets where I have access to so many kids. And I'm very fortunate that there's a whole generation of even like male athletes who've only known a female coach or have only known a female leader or CEO. And for them, it's strange to see the girls in the hallway or why aren't they doing the same things that we're doing? And that's that's a pretty amazing space to be in. And I'm very fortunate that all these extra skills that I've learned along the way um, let me be more reflective of my time and less bitter about it and be more like change driven. So I have less of a background than probably both of them. So that's okay though. Um, when I, I came up through, I, like I said, I started my senior year, took a little bit, but I knew of wrestling prior to that. I was actually part of the sports medicine student team that would travel with the teams. And I was assigned my sophomore year to wrestling. And from that day on, from that match, I fell in love with it. I wanted to be with the team. I didn't want to do any other sports. I didn't want to do the basketball. I just wanted to focus on being there with the wrestling team because I just loved the atmosphere. I loved how, even though it's a single man sport, sometimes your teammates are cheering you on. You're working together in the room. You're being there. Even if our practices back in my high school were boys and girls combined, even though we had two separate programs. Um, so my senior year, I finally was able to convince the parents, like I said, got on the team, worked my butt off, and that diversity helped me out being able to be more open. I used to be way quiet, shy, didn't talk really. I had so much hardship of being not a shy girl anymore. And I was like, okay, well, I need to be verbal. I need to talk. And so when they were, they said, hey, we need you to be a mad official, I go, well, I've never seen a woman out here. Like, what does a woman mad official look like? And what do we do? And so when I started the, I started with Freestyle and Greco for season first. And that was some hardship. I will admit that because even the coaches in Washington weren't used to seeing a woman out here. And so that was, it was a very big learning point where I had so many mentors in Washington and the states surrounding me where they're like, don't give up. You have potential. And so what I would do is I would overanalyze videos and watch videos and critique myself and change my angles or go in the practice room with the athletes and say, okay, can you do this move so I can see what it looks like and what the score should be? And I would just practice like no other, even with them, even to this day, I would still go into the mat room and go practice with them or just say, hey, you just did that throw. What do you think that point, what your point should be with that? And I would help them learn while I'm sitting there training also with them. And then like with like learning everything from every, even the athletes, like even to this day, there are certain things where I'm on the mat and I go, Ooh, I've never seen that before. Okay. I'm going to go back home and go learn how to do that. Or, okay. Their angle was different here. What if I switch positions and get to the other side? Can I see something else? Or can I see this potential hold? Um, so being that support for even to this day where I go into rooms like Leslie does and I help out the younger generations, I show them like, hey, you can be out here too. This is how you do it. And even with like the folk style side, I do folk style officiating for our high schools around here. And I'm a part of our board member in our association over here too. And I say, you guys, look. Yes, the weigh-ins used to be in the locker room, but you know what? We're going to put them out here so us women officials can actually do the weigh-ins and not be stuck in a locker room. Um, that was one big thing I had to learn because there wasn't many women here. I th there was, we're all spread out. There's still a small amount here, but we're pushing through. We're kind of isolated, but you know what? We're getting higher numbers here and that's just all that matters to all of us. And going based off of that, so I like so obviously I didn't have the opportunity to wrestle Greco. 
like when I was younger, like they don't have, like they had freestyle, they had folk style, all for the ladies, but I took it upon myself recently to really, really learn Greco. So they have some Greco Roman practices here. And I'm like, obviously I didn't do the sport. So I got to put myself in a position where I'm seeing these holds. So now I want to feel these holds. And even though those practices are hard and I'm not as strong, but like, you know, just being in practice rooms like that, where they're going over specific techniques. And I'm like, I want to feel that technique. I want to be part of technique. I want to be like, think as like, and how, if I was an athlete, where would I want the official to be when this is being scored or looking for a pin? So this is like instances like that, that where I'm, I'm looking for these, you know, holds like leg holes. I even caught myself like the other day, doing a leg foul in Greco-Roman, like, you know, you can't post on the hip, like, and I caught myself doing that. I'm like, okay. So like, just to put myself in a position as a referee to look for this hold, you know, I want, this is why I do what I do to be the best, you know, person available for these athletes to have the right score, to have the most accurate score. You know what I mean? Um, so I think I originally wrote this question or we wrote this question thinking of like technical kind of skills and background. And I really love that each of you talked more about your personal skills that you had developed and acquired over your life and how you really utilized those uh, and, and became change makers in each position that you had. It's so awesome. Um, thank you so much for sharing. So this next question was originally supposed to be for only a few of you guys, uh, but I'm actually gonna open it up to everybody. Uh, again, not everyone has to answer it, uh, but would love to hear from whoever is interested and sparked by it um you all hold very different and essential roles in wrestling um we have media we have ceos we have uh, advocacy and research we have um, um officiating so i would love to hear from whoever's interested in answering how you can help elevate other women to step into roles like yours and beyond um, and then if you are willing, what are maybe some specific and tangible things that you guys do daily or weekly or monthly to welcome women into your uh, professional circles, as well as elevate them throughout wrestling? Well, I'll jump in. For me, and this has been the basis of Andrea and, and, and my work is, is the education piece for so long. I mean, 2017, 18, for sure. It was visibility, 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 and then the education and, and everything continues to dovetail back in to the need for education. So, so for me, I, I've kind of pulled my three C's that I've been using. For me, it's communication, collaboration, but you know, you can communicate and send all you want out, but unless we have the conversations. So for me, trying to reach out more to individual women, uh, often, you know, I may send an email, how's things going? You know, what are the challenges? Uh, what are the concerns? Uh, what's making it really hard for you, you know, in your state or in your, you know, club or wherever you are, um, you know, that's kind of how I found Charlotte uh, and Lori as well, you know, was just in the early days, we were just, we were searching for anybody that was interested in, in talking about girls wrestling. And, and we started having those conversations and Charlotte, I think it was probably our conversation with you was like, I'm not alone. I, it, there's other people that understand the challenges. There's other people that are willing to talk about it and start brainstorming and, and thinking about how can we, how can we change the, the path, you know, that some women find themselves on because they're, you know, they're, they're maybe it's hard for them to get the words in. It's hard to them to be seen as, as equals, you know, whether it's as a coach or a, a leader uh, or somebody that, that's in that wrestling room wanting to promote women and build up the women's program within their state. So for me, it's, it's that constant, connection. And, and again, for me, it's, I think about just this last week, I probably had three or four calls with men within the sport who wanted to say, how can I advocate? What's going on? You know, what's the data like? We still, I'm going to jump back. We, if you're on Facebook, the world of girls wrestling is exploding, but we're still such a very small part of that. 
and the need to continue to educate at a state level, regional and national level is so important for all of us. So uh, for me, it's just that constant outreach and phone calls to, to support other women and bring them along, help them understand, you know, how to open those doors and, and step into some leadership roles. Going off of a uh, Mount official side, um, most of the time when I'm at tournaments and stuff, I look and I look at the table help. I see if they're younger, if they're older, or whatever they are. I and I ask them their background. I go, "Hey, how how are you involved? Are you a parent? Are you an athlete? What do you do?" And then I ask them how old they are. If they're old enough to mat, be a mat official, I go, "Hey, have you been wondering about trying? Have you done this? Have you done that?" And most of the time when I'm sitting there talking to them, like, um, for instance, a lot of the time you'll have the cameras that are run by students or volunteers. And I say, hey, what did you think this scoring action was? And I'll talk them through it of why it was different and why not. And so most of the time when I try helping them push through and say, hey, come, come help out, come try, just do one match with me. And I'll stay on that side with them, especially in the local tournaments. I'll pull kids from the side that are my towel tappers. I say, while you're running around trying to hit me with the towel, come back actually be behind me during the tournament or the match. And I'll tell you why I'm standing right here or why I'm right here in this position. I actually make them follow me. And it's actually helped a lot of our younger athletes over here that will go be at the same tournament and they'll be working on the mat. And when it's on, they're on deck, they'll go and go actually compete. So pushing for that, and we're actually getting our numbers higher over here because of that. We're trying to push for those younger athletes to understand, you know what, it's okay for not just being a coach. You can do other positions and, and explaining stuff to them. And like, yes, they sometimes they won't get the pay for it, but like I give out stuff, like I keep pins in my bag. I keep, AV, I keep wristbands, I keep extra stuff. And I say, hey, you did an awesome job today. The gear I just gave you to wear today, you can keep it. I don't want it. That's yours to keep. And so it kind of gets kids in their mind going, oh, wow, okay, someone actually believes in me. I'm going to actually keep trying. And it's just being there for people helps out and giving them multiple websites. Like on the Matt official side, we have websites on Facebook. We have a page. We have everything where we go, hey, here's the match of the day or the call of the day. What do you call? And we help each other out. So then we have a whole bunch of comments in there of different, like people see this and people see that. And so everyone can learn. And they, even I push for even parents, like other women uh, parents that are sitting in the stands or even, even the guys, I go, hey, you're coaching. Why haven't you stepped on the mat as a youth, a youth coach? Come join us. Like you'll love it. And we've been, it's been a really good push for that, pushing for coaches to help out, especially in our state. And we're trying other states too, of just getting more people involved. I think one of the best things that you can do, anybody listening, male or female, is if you're trying to help elevate a woman, just say her name. Like when you've got people that you're talking to, say her name, say, I mean, even if she's not there fully at that level of maybe the expectation of the job, say her name, like get her, get her name out there, help her develop. Maybe other people will hear that and uh, reach out to help her develop, or maybe they'll just give her a shot. Um, I know when I was at USA wrestling, we were hiring a coordinator at one point, we had two really good candidates and um, the woman kind of stood out actually, just because of her skill set. And um, uh, I think one person was maybe on our committee was leaning more towards the male and then two of us were leaning towards the female and I said we've really got us like make a commitment to get more women in wrestling media and it starts right here and so um she was very well qualified and she kind of was the top candidate but it was just that making that um not just saying we're going to hire the best one we're going to hire her because we're also going to help improve the state of women's wrestling or sorry of women in wrestling media by hiring someone not just saying we want to see more women in wrestling media, we're actually going to hire one. And so, yeah, I would say just advocate for women around you, say their name and um, yeah, <laughs> that's it. And I know this suggestion maybe doesn't work for every situation, but I, I run tournaments and 
I run tournaments, tournaments make money, and then I have money to purchase coach, um, uh, coaching courses for our high school wrestlers that have graduated that want to start moving into this high school coaching space. But if you're not a teacher, you have to take a $400 coaching course, right? So this week I'll be sponsoring my second person who um, formerly wrestled for us in dual team, you know, youth opportunities who now wants to come back to wrestling and wants to get involved in their community and in their school, but there's this $400 barrier in the way, right? And connecting with high school coaches that I didn't know that I only met because they already are teachers and have a high school coaching position and letting them know that USA Wrestling has all of these resources, but the, the like the secret knock, right? To get the door opened starts with being a wrestling leader. And so recognizing that like, I can walk you through that process of you're gonna need the background check and a safe sport training. And then after that, we're gonna get you your USA, you know, leader card and you're gonna need a bronze course, right? And so if you've got the other group of people who've already paid their $400 for the course and now they're like, you want me to do more background checks? Right, you want me to do these other things, but really taking where we can um, the barriers out of the way for people, I think is just really important. And then if I can train more people to be tournament directors, then I can train them to um, pay it forward in ways that are meaningful where they're at. I think to add one final thing to that, because that's amazing what you just said, is that you know, we beat the streets. We we spent a lot of time developing the next generation, and so we we do mostly leadership development through our work. Like we say, and get and like enrich, engage, empower, evolve. Um, and so we see our young people coming up through the program, learning how to use their voice. And then I started going to like these national camps, and I was meeting these incredible like world team athletes, and I was just always so impressed by them. But then what I realized was like accolades and accomplishments doesn't equal confidence. And so I remember having a conversation, I won't say which, which athletes they were, but these like world team medalists who were getting in front of a group of like kids and, and women coming to be the seats programs. And they were like, oh, you know, like, and not really talking themselves up. And I pull one of the side, I was like, listen, like you got to hit them with your accomplishments. You got to start like, I am a world medalist. I've done this and this and this. And all the kids are like, whoa, that's amazing. And I was like, Yes, like go out there and be proud of what you've done. Don't humble yourself. Like let let them hear it. And um, because we always say, like, you know, it's good to see yourself. You know, if you see it, then then you can be it. But if you do it, like own it and be proud of it and make sure everyone knows and, and the next generation can be proud of it too. So that was something that I was really surprised to see was like these women that I've looked up to just almost not um probably like, like talking about their accomplishments to this group of next generation. And um, that and I would be like, that's my gift back is like, no, like you are powerful. You are strong. Get out there and tell everyone about it and, and get those kids to look up to you and admire you too. You know, we have talk. Oh, I'm sorry, Liz. You're good. You're good. You're good. Uh, yeah. So what I've been doing to like how really help elevate, you know, women in the community is just, I, uh, Iowa, do we have the luxury of having all these women college wrestling programs? So what I've been doing is going to wrestling rooms, doing little clinics um, and trying to let the ladies know, like, you know, this is another profession you could get into. And if you do want to try, you know, getting to officiating, you know, it and or coaching, for a matter of fact, it's best to understand the rules based on instead of based on your own personal experiences. So what I've been doing is like going to clinics, educating on the rules, familiarizing with the rules and knowing that I've been trying to have like that good coaching and officiating relationship, because I think that's very important. And like for these women that are wrestling freestyle year round, I think they would be great freestyle officials. They don't have a break in the season in folk style, like many of the men's programs do. Like they're familiar with freestyle. They know what passivity looks like. So they don't have that folk style break that many of us do have so like this past weekend I was able to help out this young lady she's going to coaching but I've been training her to understand the rules that way she knows the right moment when to throw in that brick or when to throw in that challenge brock or when to go to the you know check the score check the time so making sure she like understood that so she gets ready for that next transition 
And another aspect is, um, uh, so this past girls folks down nationals, my best friend and I, uh, she's another official. I think she'd be also a great candidate for one of these series, Kim Hernandez. So we hosted the girls finals the last day, and we really took that time to really elevate the women and, you know, um, uh, evaluate them. And, you know, we got to work together. So it was nice to have a supportive environment like that. Like, you know, when women support each other, it just hits differently, you know, whenever you go into coaching or officiating, but, you know, when you have that support system as an official or any type of like, you know, support as in any part of wrestling, it just, you feel like you could keep on going. And I just want, I want to provide. This is incredible. I, I hear like things as far as like financially supporting people through some of the things like literally say their name anywhere and everywhere you can say it. Uh, things like putting it in perspective, like even our best athletes in the world are intimidated and have imposter syndrome. So does it really matter if you have wrestling experience or not to be involved in our sport, right? We're all a little bit nervous to do something outside of our comfort zone. Um, and then it sounds like Leslie and Susanna, you guys are lit literally in the moment live, like grabbing kids and being like, you can do it and mentoring them in the moment, which is like, it's incredible. So thank you all so much for sharing. Um, we are coming toward the end of our time. So I would really love to get to um, some of our attendee questions. And, uh, you know, and then we'll come back to hear some final wisdom uh, from these speakers, but let me just hop over and see what we have. So for our first question is uh, directed towards our officials. It says, I'm sure you've heard of how so many women struggle with imposter syndrome. Is this something you've had to work through? And how is that unique to officiating where you have to present uh, yourself, that you're so sure of yourself? in front of, I guess, a lot of people. <laughs> Leslie, do you want to go first? You want me to? <laughs> you could go first because I'm still pending. <laughs> no worries. Um, the whole part of where um, you're in front of a lot of people, yes. Um, I've I get nervous. I'll admit it. Every match I get out there, even like little kids, I get a little nervous, but I was told by one of my favorite mentors. Um, I'm, I won't name drop or anything, so I'm good. Um, but he knows who he is. Uh, he told me fake it till you make it. So hold your points up high, make yourself look confident, no matter what, even if you aren't, in, you're not correct on the mat, but you have your team around you or well, that can help you out. Or if you're on single man mechanic and you're, you walk up to the table and you go, you know what, coach, you are right. I messed up on that call. Let me fix what I did wrong and get it fixed. You know, it's owning what, owning up to what you did wrong. Um, another thing of like what I do is you pick up traditions. Like I'll admit when I go on the side of the mat and I know it's a finals match. If you ever watch me, I do double tap with my toes and then I click my heels together, just tapping my shoes around, just adjusting my feet. It's kind of a ritual, like how everyone, every wrestler has something they do in the middle of the mat. Um, and then right before I walk up onto the mat, I take a deep breath and blow it out. And I just go out there and I make myself calm. Um, another tradition that I picked up was I smile all the way till I go into the center of the mat and I smile and I shake both athletes' hands. I say, let's have a good match. Let's have a good match. And I make them shake hands. And then as I'm blowing the whistle, I get my serious face. So that's why if you ever see photos of me and it doesn't look like I'm smiling, it's just because I'm focusing so hard to make sure I don't mess up that I just, I have a serious look and I can't help it. Um, no matter how many times I'm like, oh wait, we're at, we're shaking hands and raising hands now, I can smile. Nope, I'm just like dead straight. I need to focus. I can't. It's just how I am. Um, you just pick up traditions. You you pick, nitpick at yourself so much more than other people do that you you're your hardest judgment. You're your hardest uh, critic. There you go. That's the word I was thinking of. You're your hardest critic, 
And I, for one, can say I am my hardest critic, even to this day. Like I stepped off the mat and I'm like, oh, I stepped wrong on that. I almost, I almost tipped over the wrong way and almost fell on my butt when I was looking for a fall. But they're like, no, we didn't see that. And I'm like, yes, I did. I did. So just when in doubt, always just understand you have to figure out who you are and don't try to be someone else. Be your own person. And oh yeah, one uh, another thing I picked up was if you're not if you're not like yourself on the mat and you're not having fun, try a different position of a role. Try doing media. Try doing coaching. I had to take a little break from coach uh, from being an official. And during folk style season, I would coach. That was my way of taking a little break. And going based off Anna said, uh, so my. I struggled with anxiety throughout my whole, whole life. I was just, when I'm back when I was learning and I was really, really young and officiating, I would just go into the bathroom and just cry and just like shiver and my hands would be trembling. So it took some time and like really um, learning to come back from that. And like, I've really taken a spiritual approach to really come having a calm mind before I go in a match. So I really, I, I'm a Christian and I've really, um, really, I, I would say a prayer. So this is something I picked up. This is my tradition. I walk a full circle around the mat, but I'm saying a prayer and it, usually it's a mantra. And lately my mantra has been, God is within me. I am enough. God is within me and I am enough. And then I'll say a prayer like God, I pray for strength and wisdom throughout this practice. I pray for athlete safety and, sh and wisdom went out throughout my calls. And then I just learned to have fun with it as well. So I really depersonalized the athletes. Like for me, it's just red and blue. It is just a game. It is the athlete's job to decide the match. And I just step in when I have to. So that's what I really has helped me out for the past two, three years. I think these past two or three years are really when I found myself and really reduced that anxiety completely. And I just bring my living in God's hands. That's what I've been doing, leaving it in God's hands. And that's really helped me tremendously. And uh, really just been li listening to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes with Wrestling has helped me out tremendously. And it, it's not for everybody, but this is what's helped me. And it's helped me. Uh, I'm 100% different official than what I used to be. Love it. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, our next question is, um, how do each of you or whoever wants to offer this up, how do you share positive reinforcement with females in the wrestling space and how can we encourage one another? Going off of what Taylor said a little while ago, learn the person's name, smile introduce yourself again if they can't remember you because we all meet a whole bunch of people I can't remember everyone's name but just, just say admit it go hey remind me your name and then you're like oh perfect thank you so much I and then just get a conversation enjoy each other's time especially since we're all in this sport together even if it's any coach or any athlete you know have fun I also think it's like underrated when somebody remembers your name, you all of a sudden go from feeling like a stranger in this isolated space to like all you're in a family and a community. Uh, so like using somebody's name, super underrated, super power tool. It that. really is. It really is. Like, especially if you don't remember their name going, Hey, I'm bad with names, but I remember you. Like just point out something that they did that you remember, like, Hey, I remember you stepping on the mat and you went out there and were respectful the whole time. Or, hey, I remember that awesome throw you did. Or, hey, I remember you coaching the corner and you came over and asked me, what was that throw? Or what was that pointing system? Like being anyway, or even like with media, having them come over going, hey, can you explain how, why you guys called this so we can make sure we get it correct on the article? Or learning, learning how to spell, when they want to learn how to spell names correctly. Like, hey, can you help me spell this name correctly? Any of that type of stuff is really important. I think for us as women too, we can just really make ourselves available to other people, right? Just, um, I guess, in whatever space you're in, 
letting people know like, Hey, my DMS are open anytime you need something, you know, or like just making sure that like, sometimes these events are stressful. We've all been at a five-day event. That's <laughs> 12 hours at Fargo, um, where it's just stressful and you're tired, you're tired. And so sometimes we all have a little, I, was, I shouldn't, shouldn't say we all, but like we have those days that are rougher than others. And I think it's just maybe being aware of kind of what vibe you're giving off and making sure that, yeah, you're still having a bad day, but like you're also approachable so that people can come up to you. Cause maybe, maybe by day four, someone who has been watching you finally gets the courage to ask you a question. So it's just always trying to maintain an approachable vibe. I'm not going to say always smile. Cause I hate when people say that too, but just to maintain, like, just so that people understand, like, Hey, like I'm, I'm here to help whatever you need. Like, please feel free to ask me. Um, or like, yeah, my DMS are open. For people watching, my DMs are open. If you need anything, just reach out. Like, happy to help. I agree. Same thing. Like, if you need any help, I'm pretty much I'll talk to you, even if I'm having like a bad day, or I'll, I'll admit to you, like, hey, I'm pretty stressed out right now. Add me on Facebook, add me on Instagram. I'll talk to you, no problem. Like, I'll try to if I'm not gonna get back to you within within that 12 hour moment. I promise I'm not ignoring you. I'm just trying to <laughs> trying to relax myself, but I'll definitely help out with anything I can. And I'm always, always open to, for questions. I have athletes message at me all the time going, hey, can you explain this rolling to me? And I help out the in local community too. I have the parents saying, hey, can you explain this? What happened with this motion here? And I explain why it's called this way or why it's not called this way. And then just help them with understanding like the rules process of everything. And make sure it's all fair and game. Uh, so I, I have a term that I've almost copywritten. I have, it's called whistle sisters. So me and my girlfriends and folk style, we've kind of congregated together and we made the hashtag whistle sisters. So I'm like, I just try to tell, I want more whistle sisters in the game. I want more whistle sisters. We actually have it tattooed on us as well. So um just, I always let the other girls know you always have a sister. You always have a big sister in the group. So if you ever have questions, comments, or any concerns, just know you have a safe place. But that's something I think is important for other women to know. Know you have a safe place within me. You could come to me about anything. Well, um, I think that this is a perfect segue to the third and last question from our attendees before we kind of wrap up for the night. Um, we want to stay connected <laughs> and the attendees are like demanding to stay connected with you ladies. Um, so they want to know how uh, you can further connect so that they know how to get involved um, and have more conversations about roles beyond coaching and someone even I think was like please drop their whatever social media handles they have um, or contact information that they're comfortable with sharing um, in the chat but uh, other than your guys's personal information uh, that you're willing to share do you guys have any recommendations on how to stay connected after this or how to figure out um, you know more roles in, uh, in wrestling outside of coaching well Hello. Go ahead, share the email you know for me it's joanfulp at gmail.com uh just continuing to create mentors and allies that, that can help guide us all i mean whatever challenges they may have that they want to bring to us they're going to give us a lot of great info too whether it's just learning more about the issues they're facing but helps us all navigate you know this great sport of wrestling uh i i love to use what andrea said you know when will when again in our lifetime will we sit where this sport for women is seeing the growth it has? I don't know if we'll ever do that. Maybe soccer was one, you know, early back, you know, the early 70s, mid 70s. But but we are all sitting in this, this beautiful space and we need help. We need more hands. Many hands makes that light, makes the work lighter. So we welcome anyone and everyone that wants to join, support, you know, learn how they can navigate the system. And for me, as a female, I want to know how the organization works. I need to know where can I step in and, and what roles could I navigate with? So uh, to me, it's just important to reach out and have that conversation. So joanfaultgmail.com. Welcome any emails. Let's start the conversation. 
on the Matt official side, um, it would be, you can go to our website on called WWA. Um, there's multiple ways you can get a hold of us. Um, there, if you can't, if you're too nervous to message the, or message the group, or even like finding it on Facebook, you can personally message me and I can help you get the actual link if you need it. Um, we're more than happy to help uh, help you guys out in multiple states. Um, there's a whole bunch of us around the U.S. that will help you out and get you guys known for mat fishing, mat officiating. I cannot speak today. Sorry, guys. But being on the mat and officiating, or if it's even learning, if you're going to college and you're going to a new program and you still want to officiate, we can help you figure out where to go from there. Even if it's just you want to do folk style, that's totally fine. We have people, we have connections also. So you're more than welcome to add me on, you can look up my name um, on Facebook or Instagram. They're both the same. Um, or if they personalize, uh, you can um, contact me. It's Susanna Silvestad at gmail.com. I kept it simple so people can find me. And then whether you're watching this live or you've uh, been, you know, looking forward to the recordings over the course of this week, we have heard motherly wisdom for Mama Joan um, and from Jackie's mother-in-law, right? Um, but I'm gonna give you one from uh, out of the mouths of babes. And that is that when my son was younger and um, whenever he was trying to get something handled, um, he actually would literally tell his friends, I think if we want this done right, we need to handle it mom to mom. <laughs> and for those of you who don't have your own children yet, if you are coaching, you are mothering the verb. Um, so, um, so I just think that's what we, you know, we need to do. So, um, find me on Facebook. That's the easiest. Um, but if we handle this, you know, if we're just there for each other and, and, and work out the logistics in, in small ways in real time, right. It'll just handle it mom to mom. We'll be all right. I am obsessed with that. That is like my new wrestling motto now, <laughs> life motto. If nobody else has uh, anything to add to it, um, I think many of the speakers in here said that they're comfortable with their contact information being emailed out uh, to our attendees after. So we'll send that contact information for everyone, um, the speakers who are comfortable with it out after this. Um, and then I would love to spend the last couple minutes uh, just hearing from each panelist one like major takeaway or drop of wisdom that you would really like to leave the attendees with tonight. Um, and I'll open it up to the floor. I would say when it comes to dealing with imposter syndrome, like Anna said, fake it till you make it. Um, I feel like I'm doing that right now. I'm in soccer, which is totally new for me. Um, but also I would just say, um, on aside from being a mom or like on the side of being a mom, it's hard sometimes in sports. You don't see a lot of moms. You don't see a lot of wives in sports. And so um, I think even at my job now, there's one other mom and we're a pretty big group. And so I would say um, reach out to other women really and reach out to women who are thinking about having babies or things like that and let them know that like they still can have a space in sports. It looks like they can't just from the perspective of there's not many out there, but like totally there's a space for you and a spot for you. And so I would just say, if you're a mom, encourage others that are thinking about being moms or others who are moms. Um, I think it's really, really important. Okay, I'll jump in. For me, I can't emphasize enough to just look for the positive and, and think about how you respond to that challenge. I mean, I kind of talked about that earlier. You know, if it's a really tough situation, you know, reach out to your support group uh, when you're struggling and, and ready to throw in the towel, but try to stay on the positive. And, and for me, this whole journey has been creating those professional uh, relationships. It has made such a difference. And, and when we've been encountering situations that have been really negative and people are just ready to say, I'm done with this, or, you know, hey, it's, it's not gonna work anymore. You know, we just 
encourage them to look for the positive and to start creating those relationships that that will help rebuild whatever challenges they're they're up against. But uh, think about how you're going to respond, just like those two wrestlers in the on the wrestling mat. And I think if there is to add to that too, if there's an opportunity that you want, get after it, uh, and don't be afraid to to try. I tried for the the mass board three times before I got on it. And then a year later, I was the president of that board and the state chair the year after that. So um, just don't let anything set you back, right? If it's something that you really want, get after it. Same thing with my CEO position. I don't think I thought I'd be the top candidate for it. And I even was telling myself like, no, I'm a great number two, you know, I'm a great COO. And then, and it took me having a great mentor uh, and a female mentor who was like, no, you're, you're built for this. And, and that encouraged me to get after that job. And, and I'm glad I did. And I wouldn't look back. So any position that you see out there that you want, go for it and just get after, it. even if you fail that first time, keep going after it, just like anything else in life. I think for me is like knowing that the journey always has ups and downs, but stay the course and know that you're doing this to give the athletes the best experience and just keep doing it with selfless intention. The moment you start having selfish intentions, like, you know, you need to readjust and be like, why am I really doing this? Why am I really doing this? Because I love this sport with my whole heart and I would give it anything to give it, make it better. Um, I guess my two wisdom things would be enjoy the time while you can. Um, you know, we all have certain times and certain moments where, you know, we just can't go on and do it anymore if, if, if it's coaching or if it's being on the mat and actually competing, you know, enjoy the time you have on the mat, whether it's wherever you're at. And then the other thing is, if you're always getting so much input and critiquing, nitpick of what you want to keep and keep it in your toolbox. It's one thing to get overwhelmed with so much. And I always tell people when they first start off, you're always going to get a lot of information from people. Of, oh, you need to work on this position. You need to work on that. Do it this way. Do it that way. Just nitpick what you like and what works for you and keep it in your box. And always remember what you, where you started and where you came from. I mean, if you're not inspired after this past hour and a half, then I don't know who you are. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, I, it, it is really inspirational for me to hear from such a diverse group of women, uh, each of which are doing really powerful work in different aspects of wrestling. Um, and sometimes maybe these careers have been on the mat coaching and currently they're not necessarily. And that is such a beautiful thing. Um, I uh, am just so grateful and um, I have cherished this last hour and 45 minutes so much. Um, and I have like about, I don't know, two and a half pages of notes and quotes uh, to my right over here. So thank you for filling my toolbox with the new knowledge. Um, but with, with that, if, unless there's anything else anyone would love to add before we go, I want to say thank you to our attendees for coming tonight. And uh, look out, we have this being recorded, so it will be sent out later. And uh, any of our panelists' information that hasn't been dropped in, we are going to send that out as well uh, so that you can stay connected moving forward.